good morning, still, just about. Um, I'm Ken, I work at, uh, at Esri, um, and this map is part of a long-standing um, fascination I have with the mountains, with snow. Um, so this presentation is going to be sort of a slippery slope um, to explore the, that's pun number one, uh, to, to explore the map that's hanging up in the, the map gallery. Um, I was slightly nervous putting in a talk title called Californian Snowflakes, um, given I've presented on political mapping before, but there's absolutely no political maps in this presentation. So, um, where did my fascination for snow begin? Well, back in um, the very flat middle of England, um, which isn't so flat because I can now map it using John Nelson's techniques, um, but uh, my then partner at the time, um, she said, um, I want to learn how to ski. I'm like, well, well, there's not a lot around here. But it did turn out that there's a place called Milton Keynes with an indoor ski slope that's around 50 metres long, and you get pulled upon a pommel lift and you get thrown down an artificial slope, and you repeat this for an hour. And so we learned how to actually snowboard rather than ski, because one plank's better than two, right? <laughs> All right. Um, Oh dear, that's, that's, that's split the audience. <laughs> <coughs> um, and then we started going to, um, you know, France, and we spent an awful lot of time in Colorado. And I'd do silly things like put GPS trackers on me and, you know, make maps of the mountains. And I made this in um, the, the mid-2000s uh, of Breckenridge, um, trying to turn a map into um, a trail map in the style of a transit diagram. Um, and, and I actually worked with the ski artist Jim Nehus on, on this one. And it was fun. And, you know, every time you go snowboarding or skiing, um, you know, you, you sort of sit on the chairlift and it, it's this magical experience, particularly when it starts snowing, all these little beautiful individual crystals of snow just sort of sit in your gloves. And it's a beautiful, tranquil time. Okay, fast forward to last year, and um, I was intrigued by this publication that I'd never seen before that the Natural History Museum in London had digitised and it was a book from 1899 by a guy called Wilson Bentley some of you may know this this person he's a meteorologist and also a photographer photographer from Vermont in the late 1800s early 1900s and he became very famous for making micro photographs of snowflakes individual crystals um, and the books that he published were collections of these photographs. So the Natural History Museum digitised them, made them available open source, very nice. And I was looking at this and thinking, well, these are just beautiful, they're magical. And also, hexagons. <laughs> <coughs> so I started, uh, you know, to crystallise an idea. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, it's nearly lunchtime. Uh, and I thought, right, I've got an idea. And the best thing to do when you've got ideas is keep them quiet uh, and then cry when somebody beats you to the idea. <laughs> so USGS put out this beautiful map. Uh, the data science team um, basically had hex binned the snowfall from last season, which happened to be a record year for snowfall, uh, certainly in the, um, the sort of northwest. Um, and they create this hex binned map with a graphic snowflake. Um, it was a vector graphic. Every snowflake is exactly the same, which is fine. And they'd symbolized it from white to show heavy snowfall to sort of almost the background color, dark blue, to show places that had less snow, the least snowy places. Really nice map. But I thought, what happens if every snowflake is different? Because no two snowflakes are the same. I mean, so this map is clearly wrong, right? I mean, every <laughs> objectively. Um, OK, so I. You went, go hunting, and um, you find this sort of map stroke website. Um, because there was so much snowfall, everybody was trying to get maps out. There were an awful lot of rainbow color maps appearing uh, on various feeds. Um, but regardless, this really was just an interface into the data for the National Weather Center, um, where you can download data you know, by the hour, by the day, or the accumulation across the entire year, which is exactly what I did. So. We can, I think, design something that works a little bit better than that. And so timing is everything, right, with map. Um, 
with the record rain and snowfall impact in California, and I'm sitting there in my backyard, um, we didn't get a lot, um, but there was enough to give this, this is my global warming fire pit, um, <laughs> but it was enough snow to give it a little dusting, and it very rarely snows in Redlands. So um, there was this sort of perfect trifecta um, of an idea, a sort of a spark of an idea, the resource that I'd found in the Natural History Museum, um, and the motive, you know, to make something different, something um, better than I, than I hoped, um, the rainbow maps. So, I selected 100 of the snowflakes from Wilson Bentley's book, uh, the, the 1899 issue, um, just 100, and I tried to collate a set that went from uh, big fluffy flakes um, that sort of almost filled the hexagon to sort of delicate wispy flakes that had a lot of background to them. There was, there's not a lot, they're very delicate things. Um, and I did this in Photoshop, I wanted to clean them up. I also did a little bit of warping because of course they're not all perfectly the same size and uh, filling the hexagon extent perfectly. And I wanted them to be at least consistent in that, in that sense. So there was a sort of a small amount of warping to this pre-configured hexagon uh, shape. Um, several days later, of tedious work, um, I had a set of 100 separate files of snowflakes that were all relatively consistent in size and shape. So now for some GISing, yay. <laughs> it's better than spending three days in Photoshop. Hexagons, there we go. Um, I intended to make a large format poster. I was going to make it in A1 size because I come from Europe and we use the A series um, sizing, which uh, I think it was Michael that said something about framing odd sizes, try to get an A1 print framed in the US, doesn't work. Um, anyway, it's 23.4 inches wide, 33 inches tall, um, which would be a map scale of one to one and a half million or thereabouts. So after a little bit of trial and error, I settled on a hexagonal grid that covered 50 square kilometers. Um, that was really just in, enough for some detail, but not too, too generalized. And it created a grid of about 8,000 hexagons to cover California. Now, which way to put your hexagons? Pointy up or flat tot? Is John Nelson in here? Of course, he never comes to my presentations. It's absolutely outrageous. Well, don't tell him, but I mean, John always says pointy first, so I followed his advice on this very one occasion. But <laughs> don't tell him. So I then turned that, that grid into a set of uh, center points or centroids. I attributed those points with the snowfall data from the National Weather Center. Uh, then I symbolized it using um, a tool in ArcGIS Pro called Match Symbols, the style, because I turned my 100 snowflakes into a style file. Um, I could then very easily um, map them onto these points, and you get um, a fluffy accumulation of snow across the map. It's one of those situations where, you know, you, you go from just a, a geometric shape and you hit run, and all of a sudden the map just magically appears in front of you. Um, assuming you get a green tick, that is, obviously. Yeah. Um, so, all 8,000 points turned into pseudo-randomized, organized snowflakes indicating difference in accumulation. <coughs> I went a bit further. I went used sizing and transparency um, to sort of enhance the map, I guess, um, just to give it a little more focus. And so I ended up with, um, with a map, and I'm just going to scroll through it. Um, the title block, I used a, a snow, a sort of a fluffy font to match the, uh, the snow, snowflake theme of the map. Um, I used a photo taken from my front yard um, of the beautiful San Bernardino mountain ranges, um, which were full of snow at this time of year, um, but also no copyright issues because I took the photo myself. Perfect. Um, and I thought, why not go, go all in? And I made a board of snowflakes as well. And so, you know, there's a legend which really just very simple goes from the small wispy snowflakes that are quite transparent to the full fluffy snowflakes, um, which are, you know, full and fluffy. How else can I describe them? <laughs> um, there's a lot of white, okay? And there's, nothing, there's no other topographic detail because obviously the terrain of California um, is going to naturally 
come out from the snowfall accumulation, particularly when you add that shape, um, sorry, the sizing and the transparency. You can see the central valley, the mountain ranges, and, and so on. So there's no real need for much, if any, other topographic detail on the map at all. Um, and then I put a histogram of snowfall down in the bottom left-hand corner, mostly because I had to scale the accumulation data on a logarithmic scale. There's an awful lot of places that got sort of trace snow, one, two, three, five inches of snow. And there are a few places that got over 100 feet of snow. Um, now, you can't really map that on a linear scale because it just doesn't work. Uh, the map just doesn't look very good at all. So I needed a way of actually showing the logarithmic scale um, as an aid to people's understanding. So you know, they can, they can better appreciate it. And I thought a histogram was, was reasonable with sort of snow falling down onto it. Okay. <coughs> so that's the map. And I was up against the deadline. I was going to the ICA Mountain Cartography Workshop where I gave an abridged version of this talk. But I wanted to use different visual variables. I wanted to show just, I wanted to isolate just the area that was above um, 100, it was 100, inches, I think it was, area above 100 inches of snow. And so I thought, what better way to do that than by actually sort of um, applying a gloss to the top, so using a different technique altogether to, uh, to, to pull out that area. So, you get your knife out. You make sure you put your mat in between the knife and the dining room table, <laughs> and you start cutting out a template. Because um, I'd had thoughts about this, you know, how could I make it silver? How can the map shimmer? Um, I thought about spot paint, and this wasn't going to be possible in the time frame I had. Um, and then I thought, just go down to the DIY store and get some, some lacquer. So I did. And <clears throat> I put the stencil on the map, making sure that there was an awful lot of coverage for the rest of the dining room table. And I started spraying, and I sprayed lacquer. And then um, my then partner, wife, Linda, she came, she came into the room as I was doing this. And, you know, firstly, the, the absolute horror that I was spraying lacquer around the dining room. Um, but secondly, she, she expressed that, and I won't use the precise wording she used because I will violate the code of conduct, but she said, that's a little suboptimal. <laughs> Make up your own words. Um, and she said, hang on a minute, I think we can improve this. And she went, went down to the bedroom. She brought back some glittery nail polish, right? So I then started painting the glittery nail polish across the map. Um, and I was able to give the map a manicure. Oh. <laughs> so this is the version I took to the mountain cartography um, uh, workshop earlier in the year. Uh, it was actually printed on cloth because I just wanted to travel with it. But I still harboured this ambition to actually get it printed properly. Um, so when I got back from there, I started the process of trying to hunt out a way to print this, this map that would make it sparkle. I wanted to use um, spot metallic ink for the snowflakes, and I wanted a spot varnish for the area above 100 100 inches. Now, spot ink's been used in cartography for many, many, many years, particularly when you're, you've got a printing uh, press where registration is absolutely vital. Things like contour lines don't necessarily match up if you've got a four-color print process and you're trying to get, you know, CYMK to, to match up. So you go for a spot color for certain things. So that's fine. But it turns out it's a little bit difficult to, to, um, to get done for a couple of reasons. You need a specialized press um, and you need somebody willing to do it. So we've got a lot of um, really cool printing facilities at Esri, but they, they just weren't capable of using spot metallic ink in them. Um, digital printers wouldn't go uh, above 11 by 17. That's not gonna make it look very good. Um, it was going to have to go to a full um, four-color lithographic printing press. And I, I literally went all over the States trying to find somebody willing to do this. Um, and in the end, one of our printing guys at Esri put me in touch with a local printer who we occasionally use for um, sort of external print jobs that we can't necessarily handle ourselves. 
Uh, and he got back to me and he, he was really excited. He said, oh, we'll give this a go. This is, this is going to be fun. Uh, and then he quoted me the price. <laughs> <clears throat> and it turns out, if you want to use spot metallic ink, that's fine. The ink's not expensive. All of the cleaning fluids, they then have to push through the press so that the next job doesn't have little sparkly bits all over it is where the cost comes. Um, so you can grab me over a beer tonight and I'll tell you the real price, but I'm not doing it in public. Um, so I get back to you know, splitting my, um, my map up into, into basically three plates. Um, a, a black plate um, where actually negative space is going to be the white paper that you see through it, the silver, which is going to be an overlay, and then the spot varnish, which is going to be the varnish which um, is cured under a UV light to create that, that finish. Um, and it was actually kind of fun going back to these production days of you know, splitting your map into layers. But also, given the cost, very nervous because one mistake and I've just blown several thousand dollars. So I, I, I was looking at, I mean, I, I looked at this map in so much detail to make sure I didn't make an error you wouldn't believe. And then the guy brings the, the proofs around to my house. He brings them round to my house. He was that excited. <laughs> he said, I'm going to bring them myself. And he actually said, this is the best and most interesting job that they've had from Esri in over 20 years of working for them. So that's something. And it looked absolutely fantastic. I was overjoyed with it, told him to run with it. And then you know, a few days later, a big box arrived with all the, uh, the maps in it. And I was, I was blown away with it. I thought it looked stunning. It was really matte. The silver was pretty sparkly, um, and the UV gloss over the top. Um, you know, to me, this really sort of exhibited the value of having maps professionally printed rather than run off an inkjet. Um, the difference in quality was, was, was massive um, and clear to see, and that's an intended pun. Uh, so this interplay of black, silver, and gloss, I think, works quite well together. Um, I only got 10 printed. Um, I made a limited set of 10 signed lithographs to send to various friends and colleagues, um, really just as a thank you for their support during my, my career to date. And what was really nice, because um, I, I didn't want 100 of these things, um, I really only wanted 10, but um, they printed 18 um, because they just thought, well, we've got the silver ink, we can't use it for anything else, why not? So they kept a few and they gave me a few spares, which is why I'm bringing them around various conferences and so on. Um, and sometimes things happen that are very nice and a couple of weeks ago I won an award for this map um, ironically in a category called best printed map so it's just because it's printed um, <laughs> on the same day that it didn't get an, it didn't even place in an award for thematic mapping on the same day they got an email from the information is beautiful saying it didn't even make the short list so just, you know, if you're going to put things in for awards, sometimes it's award winning but also award losing, so it's an award winning, award losing map. So, to finish up, um, there's a blog. Um, I've written a blog that describes this entire process. The style files are available to download. Um, you can download a copy of the map to print in monochrome yourself, but I'm not supplying the Pantone ink. That's up to you. Um, the copy in the gallery is going to be raffled off on Friday, raffled off on Friday night and you can get everything at that URL there. Thank you very much. Enjoy your lunch. <laughs>